to get our meeting started so I can get you out of here on time. Welcome. Uh, it's good to see all of you. Um, we have a fairly robust agenda, so I want to get to this as, as soon as possible. Uh, let me start with some housekeeping reminders. Uh, these are all familiar to you, but for new members, uh, we ask that you please speak into the microphones and be very aware that these microphones are extremely sensitive. Um, if you are a guest to the meeting, please be sure to sign in or email uh, rsvp at georgiacourts.gov so we can have a record uh, for our minutes uh, to reflect your attendance. As always, um, I remind you that this meeting has been being recorded, both audio and visually recorded. It's being live streamed as well, and as always, it's open to the public uh, and the press. Uh, to expedite voting on matters, I remind you all that we will only be asking for opposition only in regard to action items today. Um, you have uh, this art contest ballot book in front of you, and I remind you about the annual J Judicial Council AOC Law Day Art Contest. Uh, you do have this booklet at your seat that includes the finalist uh, uh, submitted by Georgia students. I ask that you vote on your favorites. Uh, Cynthia is going to speak about this in her remarks later on and tell you how to get those ballots back to her. Uh, we have some designees, nine designees, for members of the Judicial Council who, Council who are unable to be with us today. Uh, for Judge Bill Hamrick, we have designee Jeff Bettinger. Jeff, welcome. Nice to see you, and thank you for being here. Uh, Judge Melanie Cross has a designee, and that's Judge Craig Ernest. I saw you, Craig. Thank you for being here. Uh, for Tish Jackson, uh, her designee is Shandina Cruz. Shandina, welcome. Nice to see you, Judge. Um, uh, Judge Glanville uh, in Atlanta has designated Judge Alice Benton. Where are you, Alice? Right here. Yeah. Alice, good to see you. Thank, Thank you and welcome. Uh, Judge Cheryl Jolly has designated Judge Kevin Morris. Where are you, Kevin? Right here. You're all together. Wonderful. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, Judge Brandon Bryson has designated Judge Beryl Anderson at the Cab Magistrate Court. Right here. Yes. On the other side, Absolutely. you didn't sit with the rest of the designees. Um, that could be a problem. Um, Judge David Will has designated Norman Caudra, Municipal Court of Swanee. Uh, Norman, thank you. For, you're keeping with tradition. Um, and Judge, uh, I'm sorry, and Tony Del Campo, the uh, state court. Uh, state bar president has designated Ivy Cadle. Where are you, Ivy? He's right down here. on the very end. In the corner. That's a good where spot I'm for on. Mr. Cadle. Um, <laughs> good spot for Mr. Cadle. Thank you, Ivy. I look forward to hearing from you um, <laughs> and appreciate you being here on behalf of Tony. I also want to res recognize some special guests. Uh, is Judge Andy Fuller here? No, he He's wasn't not. able to make it. I want to publicly recognize uh, on behalf of the Court of Appeals and Judge Mercier in particular that, that the, uh, his service to the Court of Appeals during a time of need was greatly appreciated. We heard nothing but glowing reports about his service, his collegiality, his professionalism. Um, he did a wonderful job, uh, to my understanding, um, and I really appreciate his service on that court and his service to the state and the citizens of this state. Is there anything you want to add? I would just add that that's the first time in the history of the Court of Appeals that that's actually happened, that we brought some brought someone in for an extended period. Um, and Judge Fuller brought with him not just years of experience and dedication, but he is just such a genuine pleasure to work with. Um, literally made just the environment better every day just by being there in person. And the work itself is second to none. So he, he will be missed, and but is greatly appreciated. Well, I heard those comments echoed by many of your colleagues and many others uh, in the state who have had the pleasure of working with Judge Fuller over the years. Uh, and hate that he's not here, uh, but I do want to recognize him and let you all know what great service he contributed to our state, to our courts. I uh, also want to congratulate the newest judge on the Court of Appeals, Judge Wade Padgett, who was just sworn in, I guess, last week. Um, and Judge Padgett's unable to be with us today, but uh, also welcome him um, to the Court of Appeals and to the state judiciary. Uh, with that, we will move on to item number two on your agenda, which is the roll call of Judicial Council members. Uh, members and staff at the table are going to identify themselves, uh, if you will. Uh, Cynthia, how would you like to do this? I'll go ahead and just go down the hall of uh, the Judicial Council members and all our many designees. And I think this is a record. We've got nine designees at this meeting. Now, I've got my master's green, so maybe some of them are are watching us from afar, but we're really glad to have you here. So with that, we know the Chief is here, Presiding Justice Peterson, Chief Judge Amanda Mercier, Chief Judge Trent Brown, Judge Jeff Bendinger for Judge Hamrick, Judge Morris 
If you'll announce your attendance, that might make it a little easier. Just tell her. <coughs> Thank you. One moment. Vice Chief Harris. Here. Judge Jay Stewart. Here. Chief Judge Craig Ernest. Here. Sitting in for Melanie Cross. Here. Judge Sizemore. Here. Judge Chandina Cruz Morris. Here. Judge Alice Benton. Here. Chief Judge Fletcher Sam. Here. <coughs> Chief Judge Scott Smith. Here. Judge Chris Hughes. Here. Judge Davis Dickinson. Here. Judge Kevin Morris. Here. Chief Judge John Edwards. Here. Chief Judge Jeff Hansen. Here. Judge Warner Cannon. Here. Judge Brunt is absent today. Judge Daniel McCray. Here. Judge Chris Baller. Here. Chief Judge Beryl Anderson. Here. Judge Robert Wolf. Here. Chief Judge Matthew McCord. Here. Chief Judge Quadra. Here. And Ivy Cadel. Here. Pre President elect. All right, wonderful. We have a quorum. Thank you for that, um, Cynthia. Well, next move, uh, Judge Sizemore is going to lead us all in the Pledge of Allegiance. Judge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Judge. We will now move to uh, tab one of your agenda, which is the minutes of the February 9, 2024 General Session of the Judicial Council. Uh, if you've had an opportunity to review those minutes, I would entertain a motion that they be approved. Or so moved. Second. There's an ed there is a motion to approve and a second. Is there any further discussion about the minutes? Any additions, corrections, or deletions? Any opposition? Hearing none, they're approved and submitted, Madam uh, Cynthia. Uh, next, we move to Judicial Council reports. Uh, I'll start us off with the ARPA Funding Committee report, um, and I'm going to I'm going to give an oral report um, at this time. So, uh, I'm going to try to make this as brief as possible. Uh, the committee, the ARPA committee, has not met since our last Judicial Council meeting in February, February, but we are scheduled to meet on May the 17th. Uh, today, uh, interestingly enough, is the final day for our April application period. Applications uh, for budget amendments to existing awards have been accepted April 1 through April 12. As I reported at our last meeting, all circuits are encouraged to focus on spending carryover funds from the calendar 23-year awards. The opportunity for new funding during subsequent cycles is undetermined at this time, and that will be something that the committee is going to have to decide how to handle. Uh, the committee expects to reevaluate the status of each award to coincide with the planned fall 2024 application period. Uh, we plan to discuss what this process might look like at our May ARPA committee meeting. As of last Friday, April 5th, a total of $23 million uh, plus has been reimbursed for expenses under the current 23-25 calendar year awards. Uh, the AOC ARPA fiscal team continues to work closely with circuits on budget and reimbursement processes. Uh, that includes that staff has held virtual office hours via Zoom on March 26 to field questions prior to the April open application period. 31 representatives from grantee circuits, that's your circuits across the state, attended those virtual office hours via Zoom. Of course, we, our, our staff is con uh, continues to provide assistance to circuits as they have prepared these applications that are coming in now. As a reminder, I'll let you all know that the ARPA grant dashboard reflects the status of reimbursement requests in real time. Uh, we ask circuits that have questions concerning the status of reimbursement requests to first consult their dashboards prior to reaching out about reimbursement status. Uh, the AOC ARPA team is always available to answer questions uh, and concerns. I look forward to meeting with the committee on May the 17th. Judge Mercier and I uh, thank everyone for your service on the committee. Uh, as we continue to address court backlogs across the state with those resources that have been contributed uh, by the Office of Planning and Budget. Uh, and we are running out of time to spend those resources, and so we're going to continue to think about innovative ways to make sure we spend the money in the most useful way possible. Um, with that, I'm happy to entertain questions about the ARPA process, uh, but that is my report. Hearing no questions, uh, we will move next to the Legislation Committee. 
uh, and Presiding Justice Peters. Thank you, Chief. Uh, a written report is provided in your materials behind tab two. The General Assembly adjourned sine die on Thursday, March 28th. We held our weekly calls each Friday. Thank you to all the judges who participated. Calls helped us share information, gather feedback, and ensure we all stayed on the same page. A report on the final status of legislative items the Judicial <coughs> Council reported this year. Uh, the one at the top of everyone's list, of course, is judicial compensation reform, uh, which came out of recommendations from the Ad Hoc Committee on Judicial Salaries and Supplements. This was filed initially as House Bill 947 by Representative Rob Leverett. Um, it house, passed the House several times um, and then later became a substitute version of Senate Bill 479, uh, which Senator Bo Hatchett was very helpful uh, to the judges in seeking to, to push in the Senate. Um, a version of this that had some other things attached to it passed the Senate. Um, and ultimately, although we, we worked very closely with the legislature, um, no legislation ultimately passed on day 40. Uh, there was some funding put in the budget equivalent to one week of a new salary at the end of June 2025 for the appellate courts only, but without legislation passing, that, that funding is ineffective. Uh, better news on judicial security. Um, there was a recommendation from the Standing Committee on Judicial Security to provide for the creation of a process managed at AOC by which state and local government entities must restrict the personally identifiable information of current and former state and federal judges. Uh, this was filed as Senate Bill 508 by Senator Clint Dixon, carried in the House by Representative Matt Reeves. This achieved final passage on day 38. It does not have an effective date until July 1 of 25 because there is going to be sort of a long runway in terms of setting up a process to make this work. Um, AOC certainly has a, a, a good bit of work ahead of them. We're very grateful to, to AOC for all of that. And we know that there will need to be a little bit of cleanup in particular because former judges got added to the bill fairly late in the process. And the way the bill was structured didn't really contemplate um, a process for how you go about, obviously, any current judges who become former judges in the future, you will know who those people are. But people who are already former judges, there is not sort of a mechanism in that statute already. So we will probably be looking to, to clean that up um, next year. Um, petition for review cleanup. This seems to be an annual tradition at this point. Um, the third bill and the second round of cleanup for the Superior Court and State Court Appellate Practice Act, House Bill 916 passed in 2022, filed as Senate Bill 450 by Senator John Kennedy and carried in the House by our friend Representative Leverett. This achieved final passage on day 38 and has an effective date upon signature or at the end of the bill review period. Um, note that this also includes provisions that were added sort of later in the process relating to eminent domain um, added in the House at the request of Representative Leverett and Representative Reeves on behalf of the eminent domain bar. All of that seemed relatively non-controversial. Probate court fee schedule, an initiative of the Council of Probate Court Judges to update and streamline the probate court fee schedule filed as Senate Bill 232 by Senator Kennedy, carried in the House by Representative Todd Jones. This achieved final passage on day 38 and has an effective date of January 1st, 2025. I don't know if Judge McRae has anything she'd like to say about that. We appreciate the passage. <laughs> right. Yes, it is. Um, juvenile treatment courts, statutory authorization for the Council of Accountability Court judges to oversee certification and peer review processes for juvenile treatment courts as it does for other accountability courts. Filed as House Bill 873 by Representative Stan Gunner, carried in the Senate by Senator Bo Hatchett. This achieved final passage on day 36 and has an effective date of July 1st of this year. Um, extension of municipal court judges minimum terms. Uh, I know this is the result of a lot of effort and negotiation by the municipal court judges. Um, extending the minimum term from one year to two. Filed as House Bill 456 by Representative Gunner, carried in the Senate by Senator Hatchett. This achieved final passage on day 39 has an effective date of July 1, 2024. And I don't know if Judge McCord has anything he would like to say about that. It's all right, I'll reserve that for my report. Fair enough. Council's top two judge, uh, top two ranked judgeship recommendations were created for terms effective January 1, 2025. House Bill 906 created the Tifton Judicial Circuit. House Bill 992 created the Houston Judicial Circuit. 
Um, the General Assembly funded the top three ranked judgeships, um, which included Douglas, but the legislation only passed for the top two. Um, the House passed the Douglas judgeship bill twice, um, and the Senate did not take it up. We know that these judgeships are needed and support the creation of all that are qualified. This year we had nine circuits recommended for new judgeships, and ultimately that decision rests with the legislature. Other bills we monitored throughout session that achieved final passage include Senate Bill 401, implementing new data reporting requirements for timeline to permanency measures in juvenile courts. Thank you to the Council of Juvenile Court Judges um, for partnering uh, uh, with uh, especially Senator Kay Kirkpatrick and other key stakeholders in, in this process. Senate Bill 454, the Child Support Commission updates the child support guidelines. Then Senate Bill 533, Behavioral Health Reform and Innovation Commission Advisory Subcommittee on Forensic Competency authorizes <coughs> jail-based competency restoration programs. Chief, I don't know if there's anything you want to say about that. That subcommittee was chaired by uh, Kathy Gosselin. You all, you all know Judge Gosselin. I asked her to chair that forensic uh, subcommittee. And jail-based restoration is one opportunity to try to alleviate the backlog you all are having in Superior Courts in particular, but also our state courts in getting... DBHDD, DBHDD evaluations done on a timely fashion. So this is one opportunity to do jail-based restoration, which uh, we thought needed statutory authority, and so it did pass, and we're excited about that opportunity. And I believe it's already being done with fairly decent success in Cobb County, um, what I've been told. So thank you. Um, this was the second year of the two-year biennium. Everything starts uh, from a clean slate next year, so all bills that did not pass uh, that people want to Pursue again will have to be filed as new bills in 2025. Thank you to our partners in the legislature. Thanks to all of you for all your hard work this year. We will start the process for next year's legislative cycle very soon. Look for information to be sent out by Tracy Mason. And a legislation committee meeting date, likely late July, will be announced soon. Um, we continue to ask everyone to share information and initiatives through the committee, even if they seem to only affect one class of court so we can speak with one voice and coordinate well. I also just want to add a special word of thanks for Tracy and Cheryl. Uh, they always do a remarkable job, and this year was, was no exception. Um, a lot of long hours, a lot of stress, a lot of hard work, um, and they really just made us proud. So thank you all. Um, and with that, uh, reach out to me or Tracy with any questions, feedback, et cetera. All right. Thank you for that report. Uh, next, moving to item C in the agenda which is a budget committee report from Justice Bethel. It, items can be found at tab three. Thank you, Chief. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be here to present on behalf of the Standing Committee on Budget. As the Chief indicated, the materials for this report can, should be behind tab three uh, in your packet. Uh, the first piece of information is just to report that the amended fiscal year 2024 budget, uh, which was finally passed in House Bill 915, uh, contained $21,093,777 in funding for the Judicial Council. You should have a report uh, on expenditures and remaining balances as of April 3rd that's available to you. And certainly, if you have any questions about those, I will gladly redirect them to Mr. Zoll, who will uh, have the answer, I'm sure, if, uh, as far as the um, expenditures and remaining balances. Um, in the amended budget for 24, the legislature did add a few items uh, in the Judicial Council's budget. Uh, we received uh, what I think will amount to a one-time uh, allocation for the Access to Justice Committee of $125,000. Uh, most of you who have been here will know that the Access to Justice Committee has been working for several years on legal self-help centers, historically what people might have called law libraries, but legal self-help centers around the state. Uh, and this is really to try to work with the Carl Vinson Institute uh, to do a study to give us an idea of what the return on investment, what the economic impact is, and how best to measure uh, that with respect to that, so that we can allocate who should, who should be a responsibility for the cost structures of those centers. Um, we had a request for additional resources in our medical legal partnerships in the amended budget. It was not funded. Good news coming in, in the 25 budget in just a moment. Uh, the Council of Municipal Court Judges received $18,951, uh, which allowed them to reclaim some funds that they had lost along the way and also hopefully will smooth out their ability uh, to do their planning cycle, um, which they, they have 
expenses uh, when they do their uh, regular uh, visioning and planning process. The administrative office of the courts, uh, outside of our requested budget, was um, allocated $650,000 uh, to support the integration of the juvenile court statewide case management effort that is the, the Senate um, took the leader, I guess the lead in initiating a push for. That 650,000 comes in two parts. Uh, 400,000 is the annual license agreement to ensure that that software is available to all of our juvenile courts. And then there's a one-time pool of $250,000 that is uh, intended to um, serve counties that will need to convert to, from an existing data, um, system into the new system. Um, and so those, long story short of the amended budget, two of our three budget requests were funded, and then we received an additional amount uh, allocated to, to, to support the juvenile court um, information technology and data migration. For fiscal year 25, the big budget as it were, um, we received uh, uh, the pass through raises and, and colas and those sorts of things that, that all the state entities received. Uh, but with respect to our request, we did not receive funding for the project coordinator position that we had requested. Um, the, the legislature did transfer the National Center for State Courts dues. Uh, it had been placed at some point in the past in the Supreme Court's budget, and we just felt as a, a matter of propriety since our state court um, status, our National Center for State Court membership is for all courts, that it should be under the Judicial Council. And so that was just a straight move. Um, and then again, uh, not a requested uh, increase, but we did re receive an increase of $150,000 to fund a position dedicated to supporting that juvenile court case management system uh, that the legislature pursued. Uh, in the big budget, we did receive an increase in funding for our medical legal partnership initiative uh, that will go to our standing committee on grants. Many of you will remember that the initial request for uh, funding for these medical legal partnerships initiatives was $619,000. That remains sort of our ultimate request because we believe that's the scope that we can deliver and measure through. Uh, the legislature previously funded $200,000. In this year's new budget, they have allocated another 209500 so that that puts us at $409,500, assuming the governor uh, signs off on those funds. So we, that would put us roughly two-thirds of the way towards that initial request. The Council of Municipal Court judges, you will see, received the annualized version of the, of the increase that they got in the uh, amended budget. Uh, the Magistrate Court Judges Council received an increase which amounts to 5% of, of their operations funding. Um, and then the next piece is that our Accountability Court, uh, Council of Accountability Court Judges finished the transition of the statewide coordinator for the MAP program. Uh, that, was a prog that was a position that was previously federally funded and the federal funding ran out during the fiscal year, and so it sort of took a couple of years uh, of a cycle to totally shift that position over into the state budget, and so the, the legislature did provide funding to do that. Um, not, not a part of our normal request, but, it, but the Judicial Qualifications um, uh, Commission does show up in the Judicial Council's budget. They had a request in for an, a, a legal assistant position, uh, and that position was funded uh, in the budget, so that will be a part of our budget. And then the Resource Center, uh, who had gone quite a long time without any increase in funding from the state, received uh, resources for one staff attorney position, um, which all told that is an enhancement or an increase in our budget of $1,412,858, uh, which is uh, approximately a 7% increase in the Judicial Council's budget. Uh, like the uh, presiding justice, the one thing I do want to note for everyone, uh, uh, it's important uh, that the timeline for uh, next year's budgeting process, and we're, here we are just finishing one year, we're already talking about the next. Um, you should have received notice, but if you haven't, uh, the committee will receive uh, white papers for the amended fiscal 25 and the fiscal 26 budget cycles between May 1 of this year and June 14th of this year. Um, so we'd ask everybody, if you need to coordinate with, with our staff, I know uh, Andrew is, is certainly welcomes that, uh, but the timeline that we anticipate is that we'll take May 1 through June 14th. 
June 14th, um, uh, we'll have a, a review process and we'll try to coordinate if there's any questions or outstanding issues. And then we expect that in mid to late July, we'll have a meeting of the budget committee uh, so that we can pr present our request uh, to the Judicial Council on August the 16th. Chief, I don't have anything else. I'll certainly, if there are any questions, do my best to answer them. But while I have the floor, I want to thank, uh, as always, Andrew Zoll and, and the team uh, at the uh, Judicial Council AOC for making this job easy for me. Thank you, Andrew, and, and th thank you, Justice Bessel. I have a couple of comments just, just to uh, inform further the, the membership about some things that happened through the budget cycle. Um, you mentioned the amended budget included uh, $125,000 for the Access to Justice Committee uh, and a Carl Vinson Institute study. I, I would remind you all that the Supreme Court Access to Justice Committee continues to prioritize access to justice uh, issues. We continue to try to think of innovative ways to improve access to justice in our civil arenas. Um, one of the thing that is things that are, some of the things that are being done to improve that include programs like Judge Brenda Weaver uh, conducts up in no the northern part of the state, the law library down in, in Albany and Daugherty County. Um, we had asked and, and abs ab actually funded without budget appropriations a study by the Carl Vinson Institute uh, of those programs uh, to give us a gap analysis to decide uh, what are the best practices in the United States and what's ongoing in Georgia and what ROI is, is given back to the state for the expenditure of taxpayer money. Once we spent those resources and we realized more work needed to be done, um, we had asked the Carl Vinson Institute and ultimately got funding to fund the Carl Vinson Institute to do uh, a more in-depth analysis uh, and build performance measurement models for these sorts of programs to figure out how best to calculate success for these programs and what impact, in fact, they are having. So that's where that money's going. Uh, we thank the Carl Vinson Institute for their partnership with the Access to Justice Committee. We thank the Access to Justice Committee, uh, chaired by my colleague, Justice Verda Colvin, um, and we really appreciate the work they're doing to try to, to address a problem that you all are very familiar with that includes legal deserts and the effect of lack of lawyers in rural parts of the state. Next, I want to mention, not in the Judicial Council budget, but something I think you all would be interested in that was funded, uh, the, bu the, the budget, uh, the big budget, which is effective in July, um, included $1.5 million for the establishment of a David Ralston Center at the University of Georgia to assist with behavioral health issues. Um, that center, when, when stood up uh, under, I think, the School of Social Services, uh, will have a director and will be providing technical assistance to counties and to jails and to sheriffs and to others about how best to deal with behavioral health populations in, involving the criminal justice systems in their respective communities. That center, we hope, will also be doing research, uh, very, very emp empirical and, and validated research, uh, and hope we'll, they will be promulgating best practices on, on what we can do in the judicial system to address this population. So I wanted you all to be aware of that appropriation as well, even though it didn't come through the Judicial Council budget. Any other questions concerning the budget? Thank you, Justice Bethel. Chief. <clears throat> Next, uh, I turn to my colleague, Justice uh, Sean LaGrua. Uh, Justice LaGrua will present on the Judicial Council Security Committee. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Chief. Thank you again for letting me work on this. As Justice P Presiding Justice Peterson has already port reported, the personally protected information of judges that bill did the personal identifiable information passed. We will be working with Ms. Clanton and the AOC over the next year and a couple of months to make sure we're ready to implement that come July of next year on its effective date. Um, the legislative subcommittee was very impactful, and I want to particularly thank Darren Enns for his help with getting that legislation drafted and everyone that helped get, its pa get it passed. The Situational Awareness Committee subcommittee um, is working with the Georgia Public Safety Training Center to make consistent judicial security training available to all classes of court. That training has been built by Chief Wigington and his staff there. Uh, training has already been offered to the Council of Superior Court judges in January of this year. will be offered a different segment uh, again in July. Training is on the agenda for the Council of Magistrate Court judges in May and October of this year and for the Council of Juvenile Court Judges in May of this year. So we are starting that rollout. I have asked Susan Mason um, and Lynn Moore Nelson at ICJE to make sure that those requests come through myself and co-chair Rickman so that we can keep track of what the training is and make sure it's offered and is consistent with all classes of court. Um, 
Additionally, the Georgia Public Safety Training Center will be building more training for judges that will be available at Forsyth for judges that want additional training over what we are able to offer at the different conferences throughout the year. Uh, we found out, and the chief had asked me uh, when he was preparing for some of the comments on judicial security, he asked me about some threats, and it came to our attention that there are there is tracking of threats in the federal judiciary because the U.S. Marshal tracks them. And in fact, in there was an increase of almost 390 percent between 2015 and 2021 on reported federal judicial threats or concerns. In 2015, there were 926 reported threats. Um, and those have significantly gone up. Unfortunately, at this time, we have no tracking system for state-level threats. So we now have a subcommittee under the Standing Committee on Judicial Security to figure out a way to start tracking our threats at, in Georgia so that we can use that to assess what kind of training we need and also, if necessary, what kind of funding we need to address those issues. Um, Judge Rickman and I, oh, the, the one thing I did want to mention, this training is also, has also been offered to our legislative partners across the street who were very supportive in getting some of our legislation passed this year. I want Judge Rickman, my co-chair, and I want to thank the chief for his confidence in us in working on this. If you have suggestions, please feel free to give me a call. It's an ongoing project, but I'm honored to be part of what I think is a very important initiative for this state and for the chief. Thank you, Judge. We, we really appreciate your effort, the effort of Judge Rickman in co-chairing that committee. Uh, you all know um, the nature of these threats. Some of you have been the subject and target of some of these threats. Um, I'm, I'm appreciative for the work of the committee and the advisory members, very capable and, and well-credentialed uh, advisory committee members um, that are providing assistance and guidance to your committee. Um, you should know that the issue of judicial security is top of mind across the country. Uh, in fact, Congress recently dropped a bipartisan bill to establish a judicial threat center to, to provide assessments and resources uh, to state jurisdictions um, to assess and respond to judicial threats. And so this is something the Conference of Chief Justices, I uh, serve on now on their executive committee, and all chief justices across the country are thinking uh, how best to address judicial threats for state-level judges. Um, and so I appreciate the work of this committee. I look forward to more work of the committee. I know the training piece of this is going to be very instrumental. And so I thank you uh, for that. Thank you also for the personal identifying information legislation, which will go a long way to, to maybe helping. Um, so as, as you have challenges and as you have needs, please make me and, and J Justice LaGrula and Judge Rickman aware of those so we can kind of respond in an appropriate fashion. Are there any questions of Justice LaGrula? None? Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate your work. Judge Leonard, we now turn to you and item E on the agenda uh, with materials found at tab four. I think we do have an action item here, and this will be the report of the Judicial Workload Assessment Committee. Good morning, Judge. Yes, sir. Good morning. Um, I'll just start with start with the action item. There's a uh, in your tab four materials or some revision to the Judicial Council policy um, on the uh, judgeships, and just to kind of give you the thirty thousand foot view of that. Um, it really all of the language in there really. Uh, revolves around the elimination of the ranking process. A couple of years ago, the committee, Jay Watt, got out of ranking. We, uh, we approved the circuits that qualified, figuring we have objective data, send it up to the Judicial Council. Judicial Council, as a present day, still ranks. This would eliminate that, would just rely on the data. Um, and if Judicial Council approves those judgeships as they go forward, they will get reported out to the General Assembly, listed in order of their rank, all of them being over the one point uh, two zero that you all are familiar with. Um, I'm happy to answer any specific questions. If you got any questions about what is in that policy, we figured, uh, you know, it, it gets very sort of uncomfortable having circuits, you know, competing against one another for limited resources. We all know that everybody that qualifies, they're overworked and they need those judgeships. We kind of want to go speak with a unified. Let me make a couple of comments just uh, so everybody understands really the impetus for this. Uh, the, current, the current process at the Judicial Council is that you go through the, the time and motion studies, judicial workload assessment values are, are given to you. A 1.2 or higher makes you eligible for a new judgeship. Um, and we send those names over to the leg or those circuits over to the legislature. Um, the other process that's involved in this that has not always been the process but has lately been the process is that in addition to the judicial workload assessment value of 1.2 or higher, then we rank. 
and you know the process. We, we vote on, people come in and tell us why, why their ranking is, is maybe wrong. Um, that sort of, of, of political maneuvering and needs to be done across the street and probably not here. And, and the idea is that, in fact, this last list that we sent over, I want to make it very clear um, it is, it is a, a, an imperative of mine as chief, but it is, it's, I hope, an imperative of all of you all. When we list nine judgeships in this state that need to be funded, that meet the requirements as promulgated by NCSC and a formula that has been adopted, and while we all have concerns about the formula, um, it is the formula that, is, that, that we use. Yeah. We want all nine of those funded. And it's very, and I will tell you that regularly when I have conversations with members of the General Assembly or even the executive branch, and conversations come up about judges and conversations come up about judicial workload and judges maybe not moving cases, I remind folks that when you don't fund all nine that are needed this year, we're only getting further behind. Mm -hmm. So this isn't really about my idea that we, don't, we should only be funding two or three, which has kind of been the practice of the General Assembly. I continue to push that every judgeship that has been evaluated under this metric that is eligible for a judgeship should be funded for a judgeship, and I will continue to do that on your behalf and on behalf of the citizens of this state. Um, but I don't think we need to be in the business of deciding to rank one higher than the other. The rankings ought to be what the rankings are, and in fact, when we sent the nine over this year, the rankings were the judicial workload assessment rankings. That's how the vote actually came out. So the idea here is to get us out of ranking them beyond that, and that's the, the amendment that you're suggesting to the, to the rules. Is that correct? That, that's correct. And, and also, if you remember the last time we changed it, we report out now two decimal points. So there are fewer ties, um, yeah. so that data is... And the real challenge important. is that when uh, the PGA or I have been asked by others, you know, why are y'all ranking them beyond that, we really don't have a very good answer for that. Um, and so this will clean that up. And, it does. And, It'll, I'll continue to push that all ought to be funded, and uh, we'll, hopefully we can do that. So That's a motion from the committee, Chief. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Judge Cannon seconded. Is there any further discussion about the amendment to the Judicial Workload Assessment Committee rules and processes? No further discussion. Is there any opposition? Hearing none, it passes unanimously. Okay. Other, uh, other issues in the report, um, I just wanted to, this doesn't require any action, but there is, um, there's now a written policy for clearance rate awards. Uh, we wanted to reduce that to writing, um, and so now those clearance rates awards get sent out to the various circuits. They will be based on a three-year average. If you achieve a clearance rate of 100%, the council will get notified. If you get 110%, you will get the certificate, and everybody will get notified. Um, and then most importantly in that written policy, it explains what some of the limitations are. And the limitations being this is self-reported data from the clerk of court that AOC can't quality adjust it or change it. We can only make suggestions to those clerks that, hey, you may want to go look at this. We really don't think that you had uh, zero probation revocations in your circuit unless you've got a different <laughs> brand of probationer than I do. Um, and so we can make those sort of uh, suggestions and then they can, they can clean that data up, but it does require follow-up action from the clerks. One of those limitations uh, listed in the, in the written policy so that uh, we could pass that on to folks that do inquire about it, and hopefully Director Clanton and I don't find myself, uh, ourselves ready to have to testify uh, like we almost did this last time. So uh, that is now reduced to writing. We did amend one, one date, our deadline uh, to get the caseload reporting fell on a weekend. That got uh, moved to account it uh, to the following, move it to the following Monday. We've got four members of the committee that are rolling off. Uh, in June. I want to thank, uh, I thank them at the last meeting. I thank them publicly here again today. Look forward to welcoming the new appointees from all the different, different districts. Um, I want to thank staff for their hard work. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any uh, for JWAC. Really appreciate the work of the JWAC committee um, and your leadership on the committee. Um, Y'all are doing great work and uh, it's very appreciated. So any questions of Judge Leonard uh, concerning JWAC? Thank you. Good report. Thank you, Judge. Uh, next, moving to the Technology Committee with items found at tab 5, uh, Judge Steve Kelly uh, will present an oral report, and I think there's a written report in the material. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, again, thank you for allowing me to uh, chair that committee. We receive reports from a lot of different um, things that are going on in, in the AOC and the judicial branch every, every meeting. Uh, those are in our tab in the report that's in, in behind the tab. 
I want to just bring, of course, technology affects uh, every committee, it seems like, whether it's access to justice committee or, or uh, workload assessment committee. Um, there's uh, public safety issues, of course, technology affects. Um, so we hear a lot of different reports in that regard. Uh, I want to just concentrate on three things this morning. One, of course, is AI. We have started dem demoing certain AI uh, software. They, that's very, there's, AI has a lot of good, and I think the good far outweighs the bad. Uh, the bad is out there. Um, and the legislature this year had several bills dealing with the deep fakes, and, and uh, I have a professional, I have a brother, uh, Law, who's a professional photographer, and uh, what what they can do now with with photoshopping with AI is pretty scary. And I think you know we'll have to deal with that in the future. Uh, but the good thing about it is, I wanted to, some of the demos that we did, and was that with AI now, some of the good things that you're I think you're going to start seeing, and we're going to start having some regular. Um, hopefully, the technology Committee can come up with a good list of good AI products that the judicial branch should should consider. Uh, one of them, for instance, is both both the well-known legal research uh, platforms have AI-empowered uh, research already now. It's there. It's pretty neat. Um, they also have uh, third-party products that are coming on where you can upload your own information. So all your – this is for lawyers, too. I mean, you upload your – for judges, if you have a big civil case, all the discovery, depositions, briefs – can all be uploaded to your own individual database. And then you can use AI to perform uh, research on those briefs, outline the briefs, shepherdize the cases. You can upload, con if it's a contract case, you can upload the contracts. It'll outline the contracts, go out and give you relevant law on each provision of the contract. It's pretty amazing, and I think it will help it will be uh, revolutionary for a lot of um, uh, lawyers and judges, or staff attorneys, probably more than than the judges. Uh, but it will certainly uh, it will certainly uh, uh, might help them. And if they have long depositions, they can actually once they're uploaded to the database, they can ask AI to go out and look for certain words and concepts and and compare those concepts. So it's it's a uh, a lot to be coming on that regard, and so. Looking forward to that and uh, the good part of AI. I um, also want to mention uh, that we have the uh, VCC, which is our virtual calendar call that's been developed by the technology department of AOC. And, uh, and that's just a very simple, doesn't have AI in it, I don't think, Mr. Luke. <laughs> His team developed this. It's a very simple database that judges of all classes, of course, can use if you want to send out uh, a, a calendar to uh, lawyers and have them respond instead of having them respond back by email. You can have, it'll go, they respond back to this uh, database and there's, you can customize it, very simple, but it just, it's a, a simple solution and but it certainly helps uh, judges if you had 10 or 12 or 50 cases and you want to send, you don't have to get back 50 different emails, uh, it organizes all that for you. It's very cool. If you're interested in it, call, uh, get on the Georgia Courts um, website and and, and request a demo or request a, they'll come out and train you on it. Also, uh, training, of course, is with all technology, it's usually not the software that's the problem. It's us. It's human beings. <laughs> and uh, just taking the time to learn the software is, can be overwhelming. Um, and so we have been really concentrating on AOC has really done a good job at concentrating on putting out some courses. So on May 1st, it's Microsoft Excel tips and tricks for, for lawyers and court personnel. So if you kind of want to push Excel to a next limit, sign up for that. Go to the website and sign up for that webinar uh, for Microsoft Excel. We have uh, many more scheduled throughout the year. Thank you. Judge, let me, let me say thank you uh, to you and your committee. Um, you all always know that Judge Kelly is enthusiastic about this work. <laughs> it comes across in your presentations, uh, and I'm glad because you're going to have a lifetime appointment to that committee. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you like doing it. But, no parole. Uh, really, really appreciate your work there. You know, right? AI is particularly generative AI is is an issue uh, in the judiciaries across the United States, both federal and state. 
It is something that we're all keeping an eye on at our court, but also the Conference of Chief Justices and also the National Center and others um, to really meet the challenges, uh, the concerns, but also the promise uh, that maybe AI provides for uh, the judicial branch uh, and our work. So stay tuned, and we're going to continue to continue to work on maybe promulgating best practices. Other states have already done that, um, and we're going to try to to make sure that we address this this in a very comprehensive and holistic way. But thank you for your service and for the members of your thank committee. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we move to item G in the agenda. Uh, Judge Pipkin, thank you for being here. Uh, item six, uh, or tab six, is the Emergency Preparedness Committee. I want to thank Judge Pipkin, his co-chair, Judge Petty, uh, for their service uh, in, in the Emergency Preparedness Committee and the report prepared by the committee. Judge, welcome. All right. Good morning. Thank you for having me here. Uh, this is Judicial Emergency Preparedness Committee. It is essentially responsible for uh, giving the accreditation that GEMA is wanting for continuity of government throughout the state. And all three branches are asked to um, provide a plan. The judicial branch, uh, being no different, has submitted our plan. It is in your, uh, your worksheets. I'm not asking for a vote on it today. I am asking that you look at it, though. It's not a prescriptive plan. In other words, the committee is not detailing what local jurisdictions and circuits are going to be doing, uh, but it is a comprehensive plan to give you a framework for what you might ought to look out for uh, while you're trying to continue your functions as a judicial branch. Uh, the vote I'm asking for will be next week. Uh, <clears throat> if you have questions, you can email Judge Petty. You can email me. Uh, and there's also an email address specifically for this that'll go to GEMA and to AOC, and it's in your it's in your worksheets. With that, I'll stand on the report. We ask you all to read the plan, send any feedback to the AOC staff member, Ben Luke, um, who's got his hand raised over here. The Supreme Court also, pursuant to the rule establishing this committee, mm -hmm. is going to consider this plan next. And so we will, we will have more information coming. Um, but we want to thank uh, Judge Pipkin, Judge Petty, Justice LaGrua um, and other committee members, along with uh, Mike Engelking from GEMA, uh, for their work in, in informing and providing technical assistance to the committee. So thank you, Judge. Appreciate that. I'm going to take one more report before we take a break, and we're going to take a report now from the Grants Committee, uh, tab 7. Is anybody here to present the Grants Committee? Their items are found in a written report. That's just a brief on, update from the Grants Committee okay. on the status. That is found at tab 7 of your written materials. In order to accommodate bringing in lunch, we're going to take a quick break now. How long do we need, Cynthia? Ten minutes. Ten minute break. Uh, be back in ten minutes. We'll and y'all vote. And vote. Please. Vote.
Let's come to order, folks. Let's get started back. Let me get you out of here. All right, folks, if you'll take your seats, and let's see if we can get started back. Um, <coughs> we move to item six on the agenda and the report from Cynthia Plant with materials at tab eight. Cynthia. Justices, well. judges, and judicial branch leaders, the Georgia General Assembly adjourned sine die on Thursday, March 28th. And our hearty thanks to Legislative Chair Presiding Justice Peterson, the hard work of the committee, and the dedication of judges from all over the state. Georgia's judicial branch secured many legislative successes again this year. Since the end of the session, our legislative team has been very hard at work drafting bill summaries, and our annual enacted legislation report is going to be available right after the governor's signing deadline. Council Municipal Court judges made great use of Leap Day this year, hosting the Legislative Day at the Capitol on February 29th when they bestowed awards upon Chairman Rob Leverett for his work in support of the Superior and Court Appellate Practice Act. At the 33rd Georgia Annual Media and Judiciary Conference, Superior Court Judge Tim Walmsley spoke on a panel about high-profile cases, and State Court Judge Al Wong spoke on a panel about the freedom of speech on college campuses. <coughs> a video of that conference, if you're interested, is found on the Georgia First Amendment Foundation's website, and the AOC supports this annual event each year. We've updated our video series called Meet the Members of the Judicial Council, and you may recommend or recognize this person is Chief Judge Amanda Mercier, who starred in our latest video. Very well done, Judge. In February, we celebrated Black History Month by featuring current Georgia judges alongside portraits of their judicial predecessors, which created these and many other inspiring images. In March, we celebrated Women's History Month with similar tributes. To our surprise, maintaining the theme of current judges alongside their predecessors proved to be a bit more challenging because for some current judges, they are the first woman to sit on the bench in their jurisdiction. Kudos to Magistrate Courts Training Council and ICJE for hosting 22 new judges at the 40-hour criminal certification course in mid-February in Athens. Topics included protocols for arrest warrant issuance and bonds, as well as personal and court security. So the Supreme Court of Georgia's Committee on Justice for Children hosted a child welfare law specialist meeting in mid-March. The meeting concluded with uplifting remarks by Justice Charlie Bethel, who noted that juvenile court judges and attorneys who choose to pursue certification as a child welfare law specialist are an investment in our profession. Scholarships are available for judges and attorneys wishing to become child welfare law specialists. And so for more information, you can always contact me or Diana Johnson at our office. Community engagement enhances the professional and ethical image of the judiciary. And judges from every class of court throughout the state volunteer in their communities in so many ways. And we love getting pictures of such events. Today, I'm pleased to share pictures of Chief Judge, Magistrate Court Judge Brandon Bryson, who's not here with us today, who participated in a career day and Read Across America event at Cartersville Primary School. Our hats off to Judge Jason Marbut. Judge Kelly Hill and Judge Henry Thompson, and Judge Jarrett Usher, who hosted mock trials for fifth graders as part of the courtroom to classroom program in Cobb County. Very innovative. Pictured here is Cobb County Superior Court Judge Jason Marbutt and a very happy fifth grader. Thank you to the Council of State Court Judges and Bob Bray for treating the AOC to a sweet treat Delicious pies on March 14th, which is known as Pie Day. Ha ha. We appreciate your thoughtfulness. 
Our court observation program continues, and we thank Superior Court Judge Russell, Russell Smith of the Mountain Judicial Circuit for hosting staffers in both Rabin and Stephen counties. We also thank Superior Court Judge Amanda Petty of the Okmulkee Judicial Circuit for hosting staffers in the Patala County. We're so grateful for many judges who have given of their time over the years to speak at our all, at our all staff meetings. And in February, we heard from Judge Maureen Wood, who happens to be here. Thank you, Judge. In March, we were lucky to hear from Chief Superior Court Judge Jason Deal. With Law Day approaching on May 1st, it's time for our annual Law Day Art Contest. Please help us select this year's winners. AOC staffers culled through the top, all the entries, and selected five categories group by grade. And you've got a booklet in front of you. Uh, it's white. And so please go through and help us select the first, second, and third place winners, put it on the color paper, and turn it into the front. Because we love giving awards to children uh, for their artwork in honor of Law Day. So breaking a bit from tradition, I don't have any new judicial branch babies, but I've got some former judicial branch babies. Seems like one of our judicial council members, every time he's on the judicial council, <laughs> has a baby. So here we have Chief Judge McCord with his two sons. And the first one was in, it was like 89, 90? When, when was the first son by? It was, yeah, Cotton and... He's six years old. Yeah, six, so, yeah. New man is 10 months old. Yeah. Wow. So, Judge, should you sh decide to join the Judicial Council again? I got you covered. <laughs> <laughs> I think she'll ARC divorce is me. is a service <laughs> <laughs> We exist to serve all of you. Please let me know what we can do to serve you each day as you work to improve justice. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. We really appreciate your service to the courts, all classes of courts, your service at the AOC, and what your staff at the AOC do to support all of us. So thank you for that. Uh, we now return to item seven in the agenda, which are the reports from the court councils and state bar, beginning uh, with me at the Supreme Court. Uh, I'll, these materials, by the way, are found at tab nine of your binder. Uh, I stand on the written report that has been submitted. Uh, next, I turn to uh, Chief Judge Mercier at the Court of Appeals. <clears throat> we'll stand on our written report as well. Most of it consists of our gratitude to Judge Fuller and welcoming, welcoming Judge Padgett. Thank you. Uh, the Statewide Business Court uh, has a written report included. Uh, Judge Benninger. Benninger uh, thank you, sir. Um, Excuse the me. The Statewide Business Court uh, stands on its report. Right, thank you, Judge. Uh, Council of State Court Judges, Judge Morse. I'm sorry, Superior Court Judges, Judge Moore. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's been several years since I've been in state court, but that's <laughs> Pretty good gig. Yeah. <laughs> Smart group. If they'll take me back, I will go. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> Well, after this particular meeting is over with, you'll see that I'll be wearing this. So we, we're grateful to your leadership during the course of this year, Chief, and we appreciate we all stand on our written report. Thank you, Judge. <laughs> Council of State Court Judges, Judge Edwards. Chief, we stand on our written report. Thank you, John. Council of Juvenile Court Judges, Warner. Where? Yes, sir, Mr. Chief. Uh, Justice, we stand on our written report as well. Thank, thank you, Judge Kennan. Council of Probate Court Judges, Judge Danielle McCray. Judge. Chief Justice, thank you. Uh, we stand on our written report. However, I'd like to say uh, how much I appreciate y'all allow allowing me to serve on the Judicial Council. This will be my last meeting. And I'll turn it over to <laughs> good, this guy right here. So I appreciate well, We will miss you. Everything. We appreciate your service. Um, and I think you're in good hands. Judge yes. Bauer is going to do a fine yes, job. But thank you. Great. Uh, Council of Magistrate Court Judges, Judge Wolf. We stand on our written report. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Council Municipal Court Judges, uh, Judge McCord. Chief, I actually will talk this time, even though it always makes me nervous to open my, my mouth. And None of us room. are surprised by that. But um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just bend. I finally have realized uh, today, I guess, that uh, it is not actually serving on this, this council that causes me to have a newborn. Um, <laughs> so. 
let me say this. Uh, my counsel is just so grateful to you and to, uh, to uh, Justice Peterson. We had what was for us an incredible year. If you look at our budget increase, it increased by, according to these numbers, 136 uh, percent. After 10 years, we finally successfully got our term limit bill passed, and, and that really is due to the fact that we leaned into your wisdom, we listened, and I have some incredible colleagues who fanned out across the state and worked very hard uh, to make this happen, and it, it, it has been a really good year. On a personal note, if you, if you count the one time I was sworn in uh, to, to vote for somebody else, I've now been on the Judicial Council under Justice Hugh Thompson, um, Justice Hines, Justice Melton, and now you, uh, and it has every time been a privilege. <clears throat> and I think uh, what I want to say is this. I call them the uncommon graces, but goodness, Kindness, humility, mercy, patience, those are not the hallmarks of people who have great judicial power usually and great political power. But in this room, I have found that to be the case. And, and I have found everybody here to be someone who is genuinely concerned about doing what is right for their people and their communities and in this state. Whatever else I may achieve, Serving with the good people in this room has been one of the highest honors of my career. Thank you. Well, Judge, that's fantastic. Thank you for, for those kind comments. Um, we enjoy your service, and we enjoy being around you, and you epitomize those characteristics that you've just uh, illuminated, um, and we're really appreciative for your service. I, I really wanted to ask you, though, a question that's burning on everyone's mind and because we really weren't paying attention, but can you... Can you let us know who won the, the women's national championship this year? <laughs> in basketball? Um, we, we can't I don't know if win. You know, we can't win at anything else. But when Justice Hines was here one day, everybody was leaning in, saying, "Go dogs, go dogs!" And after it was over with, he came over and he said, "Judge McCord, I noticed that you didn't say anything when it came your turn." And what a good day it is for me today, because I looked at him and I said, "Justice Hines, I would never sit in that room and say these words today. I'm going to say it." Go Cox. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your service and how you really epitomize professionalism. We're, we're really grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we turn to the State Bar of Georgia and, and Ivy Cadle. Ivy, welcome and th thank you for being with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here for the first time. I like to think of myself as a younger but less dapper version of Tony Del Campo, <laughs> who sends his regards. Uh, he could not be here today for some family business he is attending to. I wanted to take a moment to remember Judge Erwin Stoles, who's past president of the State Bar of Georgia, former member of the Court of Appeals, and was the Judicial Council Treasurer and then Vice Chair overall from 76, I believe, to 77. Uh, Baker Donaldson came to Atlanta, my law firm, through a merger with Gambrell and Stoll, so at one time he was my law partner. So he is missed, and I wanted to take a minute to acknowledge him. Uh, the State Bar would like to sympathize with the judges over the not passage, I won't say anything else, but the, the fact that the legislation for judicial pay did not Pass. We know that that is important. That was part of our legislative agenda. It will continue to be part of our legislative agenda. And we do support it and will continue to as we work in the right direction on judicial compensation. Our me next week is our spring meeting. It will be in Brasstown Bald. We have a full agenda. We have a dues review. There's a $4 proposed increase to dues. It's chiefly for a new, a new member benefit, a research tool for fast case that will allow our members to get to briefs and have more functionality with that tool. It was recommended by the membership benefit committee, and the Board of Governors uh, has considered and passed that, and so that will then lead to this dues increase we expect to be considered. Uh, the next thing we have on the agenda is uh, the proposed CLE rule update. Uh, there, as, as this group knows, there has been a lot of work in the area of CLE, and so this update is an effort to reflect that work and to reform our CLE rules. Some of the highlights is it would be moving to a two-year reporting period, uh, and as someone who has a license as a CPA, I can tell you this looks a lot like what we do. Um, graciously, we will be at 18 hours for the total period versus this 80 that you have to have as a CPA. 
Um, so 18 total hours. And we have emphasized ethics and professionalism because of those 18 hours over the two-year period, three of those will be in ethics and two professionalism. So the proportionate percentage of ethics and professionalism of your overall CLE will be going up. We are looking at credit for pro bono, so that's under consideration and how that would be considered. One of the kind of culture changes uh, with lawyers, and all the judges in here know that all of us lawyers are procrastinators, wait until the last minute. There has been a uh, holiday period, so to speak, of a couple months where you could get your CLE in, and that will go away. So uh, you'll either have it or you won't as of the 31st of December, which will be the new reporting deadline. So it'll go to a calendar year. Those are really the, the three kind of big things that we have out there. We <clears throat> invite any and all of you to come to Brasstown. Uh, if you would also consider June 8th, I take the reins as the state bar president, and that will be at Amelia Island. And uh, we should have a great time. If you are into it, we have Yacht Rock Review will be the entertainment after my inauguration. So we're excited. I've had been down there for a site visit. It should be a great time and a great meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, Mr. Kettle. We, we appreciate your leadership at the bar. We look forward to your leadership. We have been very fortunate to have good leadership at the state bar. Um, uh, Tony Del Campo is doing a fabulous job, and we appreciate your partnership with our court in matters that pertain to our uh, 53,000 or so lawyers we have in this state. So thank you. Thank you, Ivy. Appreciate that report. We next move to item eight, uh, reports from additional judicial branch agencies. These materials can be found at tab 10 of your materials. And we start with Taylor uh, Jones and the Council of Accountability Court Judges. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. We will stand on our written report with a few highlights. Um, want to formally thank this body for their support of our FY25 budget request and also for House Bill 873 that will allow my office to fully support juvenile treatment. Taylor, there's a microphone. <laughs> I think I do this every time. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, but formally thank this body for your support of our budget request and also for House Bill 873 so we can fully support juvenile treatment courts in the state. I want to thank Allison Lerner in my office for her work on that, as well as Cheryl and Tracy for asking, or for answering, I should say, countless procedural type questions from me and Allison, so thank you for your support. That will conclude our report, Mr. Thank you, Ms. Justice. Jones. We really appreciate the work of the Council of Accountability Court <laughs> Judges, all of the uh, folks that are improving the lives of folks in Georgia. So thank you for that. Next, uh, item B, Georgia Commission on Dispute Resolution has a written report that is in your right, materials and has been only. submitted. Uh, Council of Superior Court Clerks, uh, Stacy Harrelson or Mike. Uh, Mike is here. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> no report. Uh, item D, Chief Justice's Commission on Professionalism. Carlise, welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I'll stand on our written report. I just want to highlight a couple of things. Uh, we'll be having the 24th Annual Chief Justice Robert Benham Awards, Justice Robert Benham Awards, excuse me, for community service. We thank the court for hosting us on April 17th. And just another Law Day reminder, the State Bar of Georgia Committee on Professionalism, in partnership with the Commission, um, is working on talking points for uh, Law Day. We're encouraging judges and lawyers to go out to your communities and talk about the role of the judicial branch, its importance, and the importance of judicial elections. I did what I'm asking you to do. I set one up at my church for May 4th. Um, I was very pleased by how excited they were to have this program and to get this information. So look for the um, information about Law Day in your materials. We'll provide you with the talking points, and we just ask that you reach out to a group in your community and uh, let them know why our judiciary is so important. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Greer. Um, we really appreciate the work of the, of the commission and also look forward to seeing many of you. I hope you'll all attend the uh, Justice Benham Award Ceremonies next week held in this building. Um, next, uh, we move to Georgia Council on Court Administrators. Is someone here? Good morning. We'll stand on our written report. All right, thank you. <clears throat> next, the Institute of Continuing Judicial Education. A written report has been included. Lynn's, right, and they're going to stand not, on that. Stand on the report. Uh, the JQC has no written report, and they are not here today. Right, no, no new updates. No new updates from the JQC. Uh, H, uh, Georgia Association of Juvenile Court Clerks. Uh, Samantha Cannon here. I have uh, seen 
Mr. Chief, uh, yep. she asked me to uh, announce on her behalf that she is uh, diligently working on gathering the data for the new Senate bill and uh, <coughs> ask your uh, uh, forgiveness. <coughs> <that. coughs> Seems to be an important duty, yes, uh, Judge Kennan. So thank you, thank her for, for doing that, and yes, thank sir. you for thank the you. written report. <coughs> Moving to item nine, old uh, old business, new business. Uh, anybody have any old business? Is there any new business? Hearing none, uh, we will next move to item 10 in our agenda, which is the recognition of outgoing members. Uh, how do you want to do this, Cynthia? I'm going to give you the certificate. You want to up there, or where do you want me to, where do you want me to be? Yeah. Can we go up there, too? Sure. Judge Morris, please come forward. Feel free to take your time. Um, for, for those of you that are leaving uh, service on the Judicial Council, let me remind you of, of, the, uh, of the Matt McCord plan, which is uh, you're not ever really gone, um, and we're happy to bring you back. I want to thank Judge Morris uh, for his outstanding service to Georgia's judiciary and present you with this certificate of appreciation. Judge, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, sir. Judge Sizemore, a short trip for you. Thank you, too, for your service. Uh, uh, you, you mean a lot to all of us. You've, you've really contributed a lot to, to the Judicial Council. I know you'll continue to do that, but thank you for your service. Thank you. You're welcome, Judge. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. thank you. Judge Fletcher Sams. Judge Sams. Chief Judge. Chief, thank you for your service right, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Chief Judge John Edwards. John was over here. Such a great person. Long trip from Valdosta to get up here for these meetings, yes, but we really appreciate your service. Symbolic from the chair. Yeah, we thank really you, appreciate you. Thank Glad you for your service thank to the you, council. Chief. Appreciate it so much. Thank you. John. Thank you. Appreciate yes, sir. you. Judge Kennan. Judge Kennan. Juvenile Court judges. Judge Kennan has served uh, with distinction. We really appreciate your service, Judge. Very Thank you for your friendship. Thank you. Appreciate everything you've done to help us. Appreciate you. God bless. Judge Daniel McCray. Daniel. McCray. Judge McCray. Just seems like Who acted yesterday. like she was ready to leave. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Judge, appreciate you. You're welcome. Last but not least, our frequent flyer. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, uh, this has been printed a couple of times. Uh, probably got a whole wall of certificates of service to the Judicial Council, Judge. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We really appreciate you. Thank you for being here. It gets taller every time we do it. It does. At <laughs> least <laughs> I haven't had another baby. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Will be to the other we will members. mail certificates to, and we thank uh, Judge Brandon Bryson, Judge Melanie Cross, uh, Judge Sarah Wall, and Tony Del Campo. Um, I also want to take an opportunity to give a State of Georgia Faithful Service Award, which those of you that have served in state government understand you get service awards from time to time. Uh, Ms. Clanton, come back up here, please. Um, you all probably know this, but Cynthia has served with distinction for a long time. Uh, at least uh, I was aware of the amount of time until I saw this certificate, which thanks her for 25 years of faithful service to the wow. state judiciary and the state of Georgia, and I want to present that certificate to you. And Wrapping up the agenda, we're going to move to concluding remarks, and and we will adjourn. Does anybody have any comments for the good of the order? I like yeah, Judge. 
Ask people to be careful crossing the street. The lights are still out. <laughs> yeah, really. yeah, we got notice of that. Um, sorry for that inconvenience to you all. I know our security folks have been concerned about that, and we're trying to get out there and get some Capitol Police to maybe help you get across the street. Thank you all uh, for your service to the Judicial Council, for your interest in the good of the Judicial Council. Uh, we thank you uh, immensely uh, for being so supportive. Um, I remind you that the next Judicial Council meeting, which is a general session, will be held on Friday, August the 16th from 10 to 1230 right here at the Nathan Deal Judicial Center. This will be an in-person person meeting. There will not be a Zoom option for members. Uh, as always, it will be the meeting will be live, live stream for non-members who choose to watch the meeting remotely. Um, and importantly, this will be the first meeting of the new fiscal year, and we're going to have some new members uh, beginning their terms of service on the council. So we look forward to seeing all of you in Atlanta on that date. Um, and then there's also, uh, I will remind you of the Judicial Council General Session meeting for calendar year 24, which put on your calendars, if you will, December the 13th, um, which is a Zoom conference meeting. Um, the agenda for the calendar year 25 meeting is being worked on, and we'll share that as soon as we have it. With that, we stand adjourned. Thank you all for your all right. service. We have lunch out here. We got boxes.